Good morning and happy new year to all of you. Uh, uh, I'm Etione Aldarondo, director of the Melissa Institute for Violence Prevention and Treatment. Um, I want to welcome you to the first uh, installment of the our 25 anniversary uh, innovations in violence prevention series. Uh, uh, today we, we have the honor to have Dr. Lina Augimeri uh, join us, and uh, is a it's a twofold honor today because um, not only as director of the Center for Children Committing Offenses and SNAP International has quarters um, as part of the Child Development Institute, she has done an extraordinary amount of work for the last 35 years, which you're going to hear about, but she's also the, the most recent member of our scientific advisory. Yay! <laughs> so I want, I want to welcome you to our team and, uh, Thank and you. really, really excited to have you with us. And, uh, Remind people just briefly that um, for 25 years, the Melissa Institute has been providing the best knowledge available um, on violence prevention and treatment to communities in South Florida and beyond at no cost. Uh, everything we do is the contribution, uh, efforts to trying to repair the world uh, that we so much need. And uh, so I ask that you uh, consider uh, making a donation uh, and to follow the appropriate links uh, below and in going to our website uh, to complete that. Okay. Uh, and now, uh, Lena, you can take it over. Well, I just yeah. want to um, thank you. Thank you. I just want uh, to say it's really an honor being here today um, to be with all of you and for all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules. It is a really difficult and heartfelt time right now as we're in the middle of a pandemic and it's a worldwide pandemic and I just wanted to say first thank you to you and this presentation is really about perseverance, grit, heart, passion and courage and my topic is really about you know preventing tomorrow's criminals. I know I don't like to use that word but what we're trying to do is prevent kids from flipping into the juvenile justice system or into the adult system. And really it's about sharing with you our knowledge about a comprehensive children's mental health and crime prevention framework. And that is the focus and the uh, goal of today. So before I start, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. And um, I'd like to um, acknowledge that CDI, the Child Development Institute, which is what I'm part of, in which I'm working from is situated upon traditional territories. The territories include the Wendat, the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Mississauga of the Credit, uh, New Credit First Nations, and the Métis Nations. I also recognize the enduring presence of Indigenous peoples of this land. We acknowledge that racism and colonialism are both historic as well as present in the ongoing systemic and interpersonal oppression, violence, and aggression experienced by all minority peoples. So we recognize a responsibility to serve as allies, to listen and to follow their lead. So I'm gonna ask you today, um, as we meet, that all of us, all participants consider and respect that there are really varied ways of knowing and that diverse perspectives enrich our dialogue. And I'm really hoping that we can do that today. I'd also like to acknowledge the children, youth, families, and communities we have the privilege of working with and sharing their experiences, our philanthropic donors, foundations, business, and government partners. We need you. We can't do this work without you. Our extensive network of community partners, researchers, practitioners, and extensive all our SNAP affiliates around the world. And I'd like to take a special thank you to our CDI SNAP team um, at the Child Development Institute clinical research, development, implementation, and operations and administration. It takes a village, and I'm here representing that village, so it's just not me. It's a huge network of many, many people. And at this point, really, the honor goes to the Melissa Institute for Violence Prevention and Treatment, um, especially Melissa Atman, who the Melissa Institute was established by her parents, Dr. Michael Atman and Lynn Atman, and really thank Dr. Tony Alderondo, the executive director, and Dr. Don Meikenbaum, yes, the Don Meikenbaum, and responsible for scientific director at the Institute. Um, and over the years, as I learned more and more about the Melissa Institute, 
Um, a quote that so resonated as a parent, my daughter's name is also Melissa, and a quote that so resonated with me from her parents was, we knew we had two choices, to either curse the darkness or to light a candle. The best way to honor their daughter's memory was to light that candle. And I'm honored to be here today to help, to help uh, with you to help keep that light burning. So um, I just wanted to start with that. So as I proceed with my presentation, I absolutely love this visual by Simon Sinek. It's called the golden circle. So many times we talk about what we do, how we do it and why we do it. And basically Simon's saying, mm, not really right. We need to start with the why, why we do something, how we do it and what we do. And I'm hoping that that is something that's gonna keep front and center as we keep this presentation moving and going forward. So here's my, a bit of my um, thinking for you today or my ask of you today. So I want you to think about some things. So let's start with the why. Why you were interested in participating in this webinar? Was it personal? Was it work related? Were you just interested or something else? Just want you to think about it. And if you want, please put them in the chat and Melissa and Amanda can share, would love that. And as I walk you through this learning journey, there's a lot of moving parts and there's no way I can share 35 years of what we have been learning and trying to do in an hour and a half or an hour and 45 minutes. So please think about your own work, where you are, similarities, differences, gaps, things maybe that I didn't bring up that you were interested in. And thinking about the work you do, I think this is one of the most important pieces, is what is at the core of why you do this work? What is at the core? What inspired you? What your values, your purpose? And more so than anything, what is at the heart of your why? And when I started in this field 35 years ago, this is my brothers. I come from a multicultural family, but these are my three brothers, Mike, Bob is oldest, he's on top. Mike is the middle one, he's on the bottom and Johnny is in the middle. And growing up with three brothers, we all have a story, don't we? We all have a story. We have a story of who we are today, before, what we might be tomorrow. We all have a story. And my story started to be is I started to learn and always be interested in that you can have three boys, for example, from the same family experiencing similar things. But what you find out is one's going to be fine. One might get in trouble and get back on track. And one could either be dead in prison or have serious mental health issues. And I was always fascinated by that why. Why, why, why? And as I started to it was in elementary school that why started to spur even more. So I don't know if you remember this case, the Stephen Truscott case. At an early age, he was about 14. He was charged with the murder of a classmate. Um, but as I read the book, it was The Trial of Stephen Truscott. I was in elementary school and I read this book. And I thought something was off, something was wrong, that maybe this boy didn't do this. And everybody, when the book reader goes, what are you talking about? He did it. And what we found out is 50 years later, he was innocent and they found that out. But then there were cases like Robert and John um, from the UK. And, you know, Albert Kirby there was the lead investigator. And this was James, he was a two year old boy and these young 10 year olds murdered this beautiful little boy. And the whole trial on the James Kirby trial shed so much light on what might be going on in the lives of our kids. This is Mike Newts and this is his beautiful son, Miles. And Miles um, was in school. He actually died from a bullying incident that went terribly wrong. And his parents also decided to light a candle and do something, which they started something called Make Children Better Now, um, named after Miles Initials, MCBN. And then we have Melissa and her parents and the story that happened to her. 
So these are these were cases, these are stories, these are people's real life situations that have really inspired me to think and think about the why. What is it about kids like Robert and John? What is it about the, 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 the individuals who harmed um, Melissa? What is it about these individuals? So after 35 years, I've really come to this, that it really takes a lot of heart and passion and perseverance and grit and I added the word courage over the last couple of years, because sometimes we need to take a stance on something that isn't popular, or people may not agree with, or people may not understand. And I'm going to add an important perspective from Brene Brown. I was listening to one of her YouTube videos, and I loved what she said. She said, the other side of courage is vulnerability. We need to be vulnerable. We need to put ourselves out there. We need to show up and we need to be seen when we have no control over the outcome. And sometimes we're not gonna say things the right way, but if they're in the spirit of trying to do better, do better, however it is, um, that is what I think we need to be better at. We need to be kinder to each other. We need to be able to be vulnerable and not be afraid to be vulnerable at the same time. And I loved when I was going through the Melissa Institute's um, website, this poem that Melissa wrote about uncertainty because nothing's certain, is it? And she wrote this poem about uncertainty, I think about seven months before she passed. And she writes some beautiful things in there about, you know, it excites us, it delights us, it frightens us. You know, as the years pass, uh, the needs are more complex. We change as do context you can see as the chapters unfold so does strife we plunge forward into abyss each decision hit or miss and this point here however we never lose that which we once had at the start it remains engraved in each of our hearts so think about those whys so my learning objectives i hope for today having taken us to this point at this point is keeping that why in the forefront be vulnerable, have that courage. The learning objectives, I hope, is really about understanding who these children are. What are the risk factors, the needs? Um, hopefully I'm gonna shed a different lens that may help you see these high risk children differently. And we all have heard about adverse childhood experiences. And I'm gonna tip on that a little bit on what we know about the developing brain or what we think we know. If Dr. Reddy Smaragdi is on my team listening, she's gonna say, no, Lane, it's not what we know, it's what we think we know. That these children are in need of protection, that they require early intervention, evidence-based to get them off this trajectory, this destructive trajectory. The second point is, what are the key active treatment ingredients to help these children and their families reach their full potential? Families, caregivers, these are important parts of the puzzle. And every single piece of here is important. So I'm going to introduce you to SNAP, Stop Now and Plan, which is an evidence-based strategy that is within a program developed at the Child Development Institute 35 years ago. And I'm going to share that story with you a little bit. And then there are key things communities should consider having in place to help and support these vulnerable children and their families. And there's lots of things. And I'm going to say this right now. There is no one, there's no such thing that there's a one shop, one fix, one program, and you've done it. There isn't. It will take, it's complex. It's complex and it has built over centuries and years. And so therefore it requires multitude of programs, multitude of different strategies, but let's make sure that we are evaluating them and that they are evidence-based. So we're gonna share a comprehensive mental health and crime prevention framework that builds capacity for mental health and community-based pro professionals. And keeping in mind, I only have this hour and a half that I'm only gonna to touch on some of these things. And each of these things have research on them or they have documents on them that I'd be happy to share further at a later time. So at the end, I'm gonna ask you, hopefully we'll have time to do this because anybody who knows me knows I tend to go on and then I'm like stuck no time at the end or rushing at the end, is that at the end, I'd really welcome hearing from you. What were some key things that resonated with you that I shared? 
And I'd appreciate you sharing the one thing that you heard that inspired you to maybe think differently or that you found the most helpful. I always say, if you can walk away with one or two things that you've learned or listened to or heard that might make your what you do different or, or better, I think that it was worth the time spent here. So heart and mind, when I got into this, this field 35 years ago, I came in it blazing from the heart. I was gonna change the world. I was gonna do all these things. You know, my brothers, my their friends coming from a, um, a community outside of Toronto where, you know, kids use their fists and raced cars. I had a 68 Z28 Camaro. Everybody had racing cars where I was from and that's what we did. And as I got into this field, I went and starting to present at scientific conferences, I had to shift. I had to shift to the mind. Not that I was never thinking from the mind when I was thinking about the heart, but I had to talk differently. I had to have evidence. I had to have statistics. I had to have facts. Um, and so at this point in, in my life and in my career, I believed full-heartedly that I absolutely can speak from both angles, which is heart and mind, and that the scientist practitioner model is what we need to think about. So I would love to hear you know, how many of you work with children under the age of 12? There's people here that work with children under the age of 12. And there's people that also work with youth and adults. And so my question to you is, those working with children, what do you think you need to do to get these children off this negative trajectory that they might be on? Okay, that's your question. And for those working with youth and adults, if you had an opportunity to work with them, work with these individuals when they were under the age of 12, what would you have done to prevent them from entering the juvenile justice system or change their life course? Okay. I just want you to think about it. You know, those are two important questions for those working in the field or those who have been in the field to think about those things. So as we move forward, I want you to think, is it possible to predict with strong accuracy, which children will or will not end up in the juvenile and or criminal justice system? Is it possible? Is it possible to find out a strong connection between bullying behavior during childhood and subsequent criminal offenses after the age of 12? Do you think there could be? Is it possible to identify unique risk factors that predict, it says my uh, internet is full, to identify unique risk factors that predict, and is it possible to shift the life course trajectories of criminal outcomes for high-risk children? Can we do that? Because years ago, when I first started over 35 years ago, 40 years ago, the notion was nothing works. But we have found out that there are excellent things that work. And Dr. Don Meichenbaum has contributed and many, many others like Dr. James C. Howell and that's Buddy and, and Dr. David Farrington and late Rolf Lober and I can go on, Alex Vaccaro, it just goes on and on. So it is possible and is it possible to shift a child's executive functioning processing in just 13 weeks. Could we actually shift that? So those are some things I want you to think about because throughout my presentation, I hope that you will see some of those answers in there. So this, so I, as I started to think about my why, and I used to think, you know, what is it? You, you know, these are kids, they're born, they're fresh, they're babies, they're beautiful. And what happens in the life course to get them from here to here, from that left side to that right side? What's going on? And a lot of people will say these are cons, but they're not. These are kids. And we need to think that these are kids and not cons. And we have a responsibility to help these kids. Now, as if you heard my interview that I did with you, Joni, I make it very clear I am not abdicating their responsibility. They're responsible for their behavior. 
no ifs, ands, or buts. But what do we do as a community to ensure that these kids get the right help and intervention? So I'm going to let you listen to this, and I want you to hear what the kids say. This is a video, and these are key messages. I want you to hear what they have to say. If you wanted to create a criminal, create a criminal, you'd have a pretty good chance. If you took someone from a seriously troubled home, put them in a string of foster homes or group homes, change their social worker on a regular basis, change everything, 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 everything. Keep, changing. keep changing, keep changing, change everything. Change everything. If you really wanted to create a criminal, you'd let a young person drop out of school, let them run away from home at an early age, or look for comfort and alcohol and drugs. And somewhere, somewhere, somewhere in their lonely and painful existence, you'd let them be abused, physically, sexually, or emotionally abused. And when they look for help, because sometimes we do look for help, if we know where to look. If you wanted a kid to become a criminal, you'd see to it that there wasn't any help available. We can't take your call right now. If you'd like to leave a message. When the people who could help them, who want to help them, just don't have enough time. Just don't have enough time. That's when we fall through the cracks. You see kids as trouble instead of trouble. Most of all, if you want a kid to be a criminal, you treat them like a criminal. So, um, I think that's a really powerful video. And um, so what were some of the key messages that you heard from these kids who created this video? These were, this was done by kids. So what was some of the key things and maybe Melissa and Amanda, if people can put it in the chat and then I could pull up some things that um, were evident from the video and you can share them uh, maybe with me for a second. If you wanna just take a second, what did you hear these kids say? So if you wanted to create a criminal, make sure you do what? So one of the first ones that actually, uh, and, and actually stood out to me as well, and it said uh, about treating them like criminals. Right. Okay. Yep. 
Um, let's treat, so, let's treat them like a criminal. Let's go on. Right. Uh, there's, a, so I've seen instability in their childhood. Instability in childhood. Absolutely change, change, change their workers, change their caregivers. Absolutely. What uh, else? And, and actually exactly what you just said, inconsistent caretakers was the next one that I've just seen. Okay. Uh, we've got family. Yeah, absolutely. Um, family abandonment and a lack yeah. of social development resources. Absolutely. These are critical risk factors. Constant unrelenting change uh, so that no deep personal relationships can be developed. Relationships, relationships, relationships. Don't more form any. Don't let these kids form any relationships. Absolutely. Okay, we've got don't pay attention, disregard, not accept their trauma or address it. Absolutely. So thank you. I know there are many excellent ones. I'm going to look at them at the chat later when I have an opportunity. But absolutely, what we see is um, change everything. Put them in a string of foster or group homes. Change your supports on a regular basis, like their social workers or their CYC workers. Keep changing everything. Let them drop out of school, run away from home. Let them come. Let, let them look for comfort alcohol and drugs, let them be abused physically, sexually, emotionally, make sure they can access help, make sure that those who are supposed to be there just don't have enough time, let them fall through the cracks. Uh, you see them as trouble instead of troubled and treat them as a criminal. I'm not sure how this, uh, there was something funny on my screen. I think somebody was using a marker, so I'm, I can't get that off, um, but I'm, I hope that's okay. You can still see everything okay. So. I'm from an organization, a wonderful organization called the Child Development Institute in the city of Toronto, Ontario, Canada. It is an accredited children's mental health agency with over 100 years, a uh, legacy of over 100 years. It was the amalgamation of two organizations, the Crash Child and Family Services and uh, Child Development, uh, sorry, and Earl's Court Child and Family Center, which formed the Child Development Institute. We have a track record, established track record of success in children's mental health program evaluation, implementation, and research. And we have four main key areas to the work we do. One is early intervention services, which is where the program SNAP falls in. Two is a family violence unit. Three is called Integra, but it really focuses on learning disabilities and mental health issues. Uh, we call that LDMH. And then we have a fourth quadrant, which is healthy child development, which involves early learning centers um, across uh, the city. So as well within the Child Development Institute, we established a center, which was called the Center for Children Committing Offenses, the CCCO. And the mission of the CCCO was to advance knowledge and evidence-based solutions for communities dealing with children at risk of antisocial behavior in their families. It was established in 2001, so almost 20, 20 years ago with the funding from the McConnell Foundation. And here is a picture of our founders, which was Lynn Baptist from the McConnell Foundation, Nancy Hamm, uh, Kathy Levine, who was the former clinical director, Ken Goldberg, who was the former executive director of Earl's Court and myself. And the focus of this unit is really about research training and dissemination in regards to evidence-based practices for kids under 12 in conflict with the law. And the CCCO's guiding principles have to do with that children who commit offenses need help. Children can be identified, that the severity of antisocial behavior must be measured, that interventions can change a negative prognosis to a positive one, that early treatment keeps these kids in school and out of trouble, that children and families deserve help and support and communities have the right to be safe. And so those are the guiding principles of, of our unit. And really this work really started and it started way back prior to this um, when in Canada, um, the federal government really did a great move um legally what they did was they um raised the age of criminal responsibility from seven to twelve um and we believe that this age should not be lowered um as a matter of fact whenever there's pressure from government and others to lower the age i'm one of the first to say don't have an age then it doesn't matter if it's 10 or eight or thing don't lower it because we need to be keeping that age of criminal responsibility higher and not lower so in 
under our law, if a police officer comes into contact with a young child in conflict with the law for his or her own misbehavior, child, uh, a child protection agency, if the child is deemed to be in need of protection or refer a child to appropriate services. And the five key reasons, I'm just going to pull them up, that we really feel strongly that uh, to keeping the age of criminal responsibility to at least 12 is that children under 12 do not really have the necessary psychological maturity to understand criminal court proceedings. And some may, some many do not. Involving children under 12 in the criminal justice system may be harmful as they're still in the process of neurobiological and psychological and social development. That children under 12 com uh, commit few crimes and their crimes are mostly trivial. However, they need to be cautioned because we know they're on that trajectory. That treating young offenders under 12 should be based on rehabilitation to not punishment. And really that treating young offenders under 12 in the criminal justice system is more expensive than in if they're involved in early intervention programs, and I'm going to actually show that uh, to you as we proceed. So this is how we started. So in 1984, Canada raised the age of criminal responsibility from seven to 12. And there was an outcry that the, there was a huge gap in services that these kids under 12 now were untouchable and we needed to do something about it. And really the federal government said to the provinces, you come up with programs to meet the needs of these kids. And so at that time I was doing my undergrad degree, I was just finishing and I was working with Dr. Deborah Pepler. She was my um, uh, internship supervisor for my undergrad. And she asked me, what do you want to do, Lena? Because she knew I was fascinated by at that time the term child delinquents or young kids in conflict with the law. And she was working at that point, moved over to the former Earls Court Child and Family Center. And so when this opportunity came up to develop a program specifically for kids under 12 in conflict with the law, um, Ken Goldberg, who was the former executive director, came in and said, um, um, I came in for an interview with the two of them. And the rest is history. And it was interesting because I still have the first book here, which was by Rutter and Giller, which is Juvenile Delinquency. And it was written in 1984. And my first job was to read this and to try to find out what worked for these kids, what, what worked and what was important. And over the years, I've been really fortunate to be, be surrounded and I don't have enough time so I apologize if I miss somebody here but the, I had a wealth of individuals Kathy Levine who was our clinical director we have here uh, the late Rolf Lober and Magda Stout Lober and Dr. Chris Webster and Dr. David Farrington and of course Deb and Dr. Chris Kogel who've been part of the journey from a very early on stage. Dr. Don Meikenbaum um, informed lots on the development. I got your book here, Don, you got to sign it for me. The Cognitive Behavior Modification one, pulled it off my bookshelf. Um, Ken had purchased it years ago um, to kind of start thinking about things differently. My core team of leads, which is Nicholas Slater, Mark Walsh, Manny uh, Wong. Um, and then, of course, we have Dr. Buddy Howell, James C. Howell, and Jeff Burke, um, and Dr. Depong Yang, Corinne DeRuder. These individuals have really kind of been my circle and championed me, as, as well as many others, in the early phases. And this is our larger team with Aaron Reitza, um, Dr. Reddy Smaragdi, and now Melissa Syme in regards to more development work. And this does also implode through a huge organization, as I said, full of wonderful SNAP clinicians and affiliates, which I'll share a little bit later on. So part of this work has to be, and something I wanna really hopefully inspire with you, is that it doesn't matter what you're doing, whether you're in clinical or research, we need to think about what we call the scientist practitioner framework. And the one reason I loved working where I did was there was such a vision that it was like a planning and evaluation cycle that we needed to make sure that we were going to look at how research informs practice and how practice informs research. And the research vision, you know, three things. We wanted to make a difference in the lives of these children. We wanted to apply empirically supported treatments. We wanted to be able to scrutinize our own work. We have to be able to do those things. We have to be able to step back and make sure that we can improve clinical practice. We can help advance the field. But most important, we have to be accountable. We have to be accountable. As a purveyor, which is SNAP, okay, we have to be accountable. Hold us accountable 
to make sure that we are providing the best possible implementation supports and making sure that the model is sound. But you, if you're working in the field, being accountable to make sure that what you do works, you're ensuring that you're not doing more harm and that you are cost effective. And cost effective because there's not enough money around. And so that's how this um, scientist practitioner framework looks, which is you establish your program, you do it, you implement your intervention, you assess the results, and you act on their findings. And I could share some of those as we progress. The other thing is there is you have to keep informed, you have to keep knowledgeable, you have to keep things going. And these are just some of the books that are so inspiring. There's thousands I have hit. My husband kept saying last night, what are you doing with all these books? I'm, like, I'm trying to pull some that are that have been so instrumental. The, um, you know, the, the Patterson work on antisocial boys in the course of cycle were huge in our development thing, as well as Dawn's book on cognitive behavior modification um, and looking at that it's differently because you could have cognitive behavior therapy, but then how are our thoughts and our actions um, um, what's happening there. Um, you know, this book on childhood aggression, it's this, it was a, a conference we held just right into my start at working at, at the organization I'm with. And it brought together leading scientists about helping to us inform and helped us inform the development as well. And then there was this book here, which I think was critical for me and my personal development was Child Delinquents. And, you know, it was led by Dr. Rolf Lober and Dave Farina. It was an Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Study Group on child delinquents. And it was done in 2001, but it was a culmination of years of work and major people contributed to that. Um, and then there's things that we have to think about in the future. But if I'm going to tell you there's a nugget book, it's this one here by Dr. James C. Howell. It's a handbook for evidence-based juvenile justice systems. And uh, there was a picture of me holding the book earlier with all these flags. And oh, I have it right here. Actually, <laughs> you can see it. Um, all these flags of incredible things. And, it's, and it's, it has been so instrumental to our learning. Um, and of course, the work of risk assessment would Dr. Chris Webster and others. So I just wanted to, to just highlight some of these. And this one here in the corner is um, a book written in honor, of Dr., uh, Dr., in honor of David Pico, who really believed in doing things from a different perspective, which is venture philanthropy, which I'm gonna share at the very end um, of my presentation, which is how do we do things differently and how we think about it? And we always say, I want a 10 out of 10. He's saying you need to be 11 out of 10. And that, has, that was what inspired our scaling and our development work. So our focus has always been, was since we established it, the forgotten group, I call them the kids, the forgotten group, because I felt there was a lot of attention under, under 12s. Um, under six is rightly so that early healthy child development and of course then 12 and older which is absolutely needed but there was somehow a lull in regards to that middle years group six to eleven um, and what we were starting to learn was there was a really critical phase especially for self-control and emotion regulation and then there was a group that they called the overshadowed group just think about it who do you think the overshadowed group is so the overshadow group are girls. And we started to specialize in that. And Joan McCord said it perfectly. She said, childhood aggression predicts problems in girls as it does in boys. But somehow the literature at that time, early on in our development, we're talking the 80s and early 90s, really focused on boys. And so we really worked with Dr. Deborah Pepler and Kathy Levine and Chris Webster and um, Kirsten Madsen, really embarked on this development of childhood aggression. And one of our own colleagues, Margaret Walsh, who's on our team is one of our gender specialists as well as Erin Reitza. So what do we know about these children? So we know that there are lots of kids getting in trouble. And a, a lot of people say, well, how many is a lot of kids? Um, and what we know is when people see these media things, they think, you know, what's wrong with these kids? We hear Bruce Perry um, talking about this all the time. And it's the wrong question. It, we need to think about what happened to these kids. When people look at me, when people look at me, they see a bully, a delinquent, a problem. People see my outbursts, my fists, 
my frustration. People see the trips to the principal's office and the kid they don't want in their class. They see a liar, a troublemaker, a lost cause. They see my outbursts, my dirty looks, my frustration. People see the girl who gets sent home from school and the girl you wouldn't leave alone with your purse. People see a bad son, that boy who made their kid cry or who'd ruin your birthday party. People see all these things, but they don't see me. People see a mean sister, the way I swear at my dad, and the kid who leaves their mom crying in the parking lot. People see all these things, but they don't see me. My name's Kevin, and I could be more than this. My name is Emma, and I can be more than this. So when you start to, when you listen to that, um, I usually have visuals to that. And what I did this time was actually just put the words because I wanted you to think about as you heard those words, were there kids that popped up in your mind that were like Kevin and Emma? Okay, because what we have to remember is a lot of times we see the behavior what we don't see is what's behind the behavior. Trauma absolutely being one. There's many, many things, but there's lots going on in these kids' lives. So we know that we need a lot of things to, to, to ensure that children develop healthy and strong. We need good relationships. We heard that earlier, social supports. We need attachment, nutrition, culture, physical environment, safety, genetics, education, community. They all are critical and important. We call those social determinants of health. But when things go awry, and they do, this is where you start to get kids, children who are angry, who are engaging in antisocial behavior, and you get sad kids, and you also have kids um, using weapons. So what we know is we what we're, what we're finding is there's a statement by Michael Miles, one of our Cayman Islands SNAP affiliates, saying, you know, he said, today our children are facing the perfect storm. And when we think about that statement, it was an interesting one because our kids are experiencing so many things, whether it's school failure, racism, you know, challenging or poor parenting, uh, addictions, mental health issues, abuse, poverty, gangs, bullying, it goes on. We have kids that become anxious, angry, sad, and stressed. And what we also know is that these kids can start to engage in all kinds of things, whether it's school problems, major. So that is our, where we talk about, we have some big problems. And I'm gonna share some of these. These are stats from Canada, for example. We spend over 51 billion dollars and mental health costs. And we know that one out of five children have a mental health issue. We also know that we have one of the third highest suicide rates in the industrial world. We also know, which is a bit concerning, that 50% of parents are concerned about their child's anxiety. Given the pandemic, I would say it's like 80, 90%. And the sad thing is we have really long waiting lists. And if you go into the records of incarcerated individuals, males, they will, you'll see that more than 60% had a history of childhood uh, conduct type problems. And we need to think about equity and cultural and safety issues. Because if we don't, we're going to be spending around $1.5 to $6.5 million for one serious violent and chronic offender. And the unbelievable thing is three quarters of you, 76% don't know where to find help for their child. So we have some pretty serious concerns. So we need to think about, and this was um, what we can be doing to support our kids. What is it that we need? What is it that we can put in place? Because if we don't, there's an incredible stat by um, Lober, Dr. Uh, Lober Farrington Petichuk called seven years of warning or a seven year incubation period. So it translates into this. 
kids who end up in court for committing a serious violent and chronic offense at 14 and a half, when you look back at their records, you'll see that they started having minor problems at age seven. Any kindergarten teacher will tell you that who they are concerned about. They start escalating and have more moderate serious behavior problems around 9.5, like theft and shoplifting. Just before their 12th birthday, they commit their first serious delinquent offense. And at 14 and a half, they're in court for committing a serious violent offense. Seven years of warning, seven year incubation period. And what we also know is that those kids most likely are the ones that will use weapons, including guns, become gang affiliated and engage in substance use. So think about seven years of warning, seven to 14. Think about how many individuals, how many professionals were in that child's life. So the why. So we know there are lots of kids out there. There are hundreds of thousands of kids in Canada there's about 200,000 kids. I'd be interested to know in the US or whatever country you're from. Uh, children in the middle years are struggling with their mental health. Many are waiting for years to access the right help. We know that 74% of mental health issues have their onset during childhood. We know that five out of six children do not have access or receive effective treatment. And children with behavior problems have low self-control and poor decision-making that are particularly at risk for addictions, social, emotional, and behavioral problems, serious criminal and antisocial behavior, increased emergency and hospital visits, and related health costs excuse me, poor education and employment outcomes and juvenile justice and adult criminality. And you can see just from this table here that you can see that over 200,000, but 300, over 371,000 children have some form of men a mental health disorder. And when you start thinking about behavioral disorders and emotional disorders, you can see that lots of kids may be diagnosed with attention hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, ODD, uh, oppositional defiant disorder, chronic disorder, anxiety, and depression. And, you know, if you're not even using a diagnostic thing, we talk about conduct problems or disruptive behavior problems. We know that there are many, many kids. And this has been one of the pieces of evidence that really inspired me, which is outside of the seven years of warning, which has really been a, an important piece of work of ours that we built on um, that I think has been critical, is this um, pathway by uh, Magda Stouthammer Lober and um, Rolf Lober, where they looked at overt pathways and covert pathways and authority conflict pathways. And again, the complexity of these kids are different. You know, you can have kids on that overt pathway, minor aggression, physical fighting, violence, possible murder, and then you have covert, you know, kind of uh, minor covert behavior like vandalism, damaging property, uh, moderate serious delinquency to serious delinquency. And you have these kids who just not are going to school. And how do they intersect? What's going on? What are the different things that we should be doing at all these different stages to help buffer those risks? So when I talked about the cost, I think that's a critical one. So let me show you how fast um, or, or how you can get from 1.5 million to up to 6.5 million for one serious violent and chronic offender. We're talking about like response to crime. I'm gonna put more alarms out, for example, in uh, out all over the place, anticipation of crime. I'm gonna put more police officers on the road and result of crime, I'm gonna build bigger uh, facilities uh, to house uh, individuals like this. And so when you start to look at the cost, you have to look at the cost from different lenses. You have to look at it from, oops, I'm going too fast, custody and victim costs and policing and security and probation, incarceration, health costs and education. It goes on and on. So when you add those costs up, it really becomes high. And I'm going to give you an example of the case of Tyler. And I'm going to go through this quickly just because of time's sake, but this is a fictitious but prototypical, fictitious, but prototypical case. So I'm gonna call him Tyler, and it, it is um, his path towards a life of crime. And this was done by our federal government, Public Safety Canada, and used by permission. So I'm gonna share the life event. Now this is a child, Tyler at zero to two. You're gonna see the life event, 
You're going to see the associated risk factor and what the potential cost could be. So Tyler's mother gets pregnant at 17, young mother. Tyler's father has a history of crimes, criminal family member. Father gets arrested, he comes from broken home. You can see the cost for the different types of services that are going on at that time as a result. Um, child welfare gets involved and now they must attend child care and home visits. Um, and uh, you can see at the tender age of two, there's an investment of about $35,000 in Tyler. As he starts to get older, three to five, he's now having no friends at daycare. He's hitting other kids. So you can see early conduct problems and aggressive behavior. He's kicked out of daycare, um, poor parenting, monitoring, child wearing practices. Father uh, breaks Tyler's arm in a fit of uh, rage, so we have low parental empathy, and he's placed into foster care, and you can see the costs escalating here. So at that stage, we're up to about $108,531. We're off to six to 10 now. He's now in different foster homes. He can't adjust. You can see he struggles in school. He's diagnosed with ADHD and learning disabilities. We have lots of fights at school, shows no remorse. Um, and at this point, we're up to $382,000, almost $383,000 at the age of 10. Um, a number of years ago, we could have served for that amount, we could have served at least 42 to 60 children in the SNAP program, just to, to give you an example. So here we keep going, befriending, uh, troublemaking. He is stealing money and buying alcohol now. He's caught and charged with break and enter and theft. And you can see that at the age of 14, we're up to 574,000. He's now really attending school. He's disrespectful to teacher and other students, daily drug and alcohol use. He's arrested for assault. He's learning the drug traffic trade in detention. Uh, we're up to 902,000. And then this last phase, um, 18 plus, you can see he's in adult court, receives an 18 month sentence in jail for drug trafficking. Uh, he gets his girlfriend pregnant, assaults her, receives a five year sentence, and you can see $1.5 million. That's how fast that increases and escalates. So keep in mind the story, of Tyler, think about what we could have been doing with these moderators and moderators and thinking about what it was that we could be doing in regards to buffering those levels of risk. We need to think about the child. We need to think about the child within their family. We need to think about the child within the neighborhood. And we need to think about our schools and our peer, their peers because they're nested. This does not happen alone. Okay, so we have to think about all those things, because if we don't, you can see all those early life stressful events and negative parent child interactions will, will impact child inhibitory control, late childhood deviance and early adolescent substance use. It's a, it's a pathway, it's a developmental cascade model that here you can see was done by these authors um, that really looks at um, what happens and how do we get here. So some of the flags, overt aggression common in toddler years becomes a problem when it does not decrease by the middle years. You know, kids who withdraw from pro-social activities, let's think about these kids, think about the pandemic right now, what's going on even in that case, low academic achievement, lying, rule breaking, overt aggression. Low empathy. I know you have uh, uh, Mary Gordon coming in in uh, February uh, to present to the Melissa Institute on empathy. And then you have and sympathy and lack of fear and high negative emotionality and antisocial attitudes and low self esteem. You have poor peer relationships, risky peer groups, or continually rejected by peers. And you also have things that you have to think about genetic and biological. Early trauma, we heard that, um, somebody said earlier. Individual risk factors, like maybe low cognitive ability and family factors, you know, decreased parental monitoring, parental conflict or violence. These are things that we all have to think about. So I want you to hear what is the key message that you're hearing again. And this is Emma um, Gonzalez from the shooting that happened in Florida. There has been one tweet that I would like to call attention to. So many signs that the Florida shooter was mentally disturbed, even expelled for bad and erratic behavior. Neighbors and classmates knew he was a big problem, must always report such instances to authorities again and again. We did, time and time again. Since he was in middle school, it was no surprise to anyone who knew him to hear that he 
What's the shooter? So, which is really an emotional one. And every time I hear that, since he was in middle school, it was no surprise to anyone who knew him that here that he was the shooter. So seven years of warning, seven year incubation period. Think about how many individuals cross that individual's life. So we all know we've heard lots about adverse childhood experiences. You saw all those risk factors, those raindrops. So we know that adverse child experiences, these cause adverse child experiences that cause disruptive neurodevelopment, social, emotional, cognitive impairment, and the adoption of health risk behaviors, disease, disability, and even early death. And we need to think about this and we need to think about what is going on and we need to continue to invest in research and embrace the scientist practitioner framework in our work if we're to do good better. Uh, because what we know is this really does impact the developing brain and one's well-being. And there's gaps in the scientific knowledge, especially in that early stage, which we need to think about the forgotten kids that middle years. So what happens to you matters, okay? And my colleague, Dr. Reddy Smaragdi, you know, was very thankful to put these slides together for me. You know, what we know is that the neural network of impulsivity can be really demonstrated using functional magnetic resonating imaging. And what we know is you can see that these are the areas that actually control impulsivity, inhibition, as well as um, emotion processing, regulation, and networking. But what we also know is that MRI studies of children with behavioral problems have found evidence for abnormalities in both the structures of the brain and the functions. And what we know is that most often the research has found that children with behavioral problems what they found is they have lower gray matter volume compared to healthy children in the prefrontal area cortex, okay, or the cingulate cortex and parts of the limbic system. And so we need to think about this. We need to think about can this be changed and how do we do that? So here you can see that in this diagram, 10% less gray matter um, for these kids um, and children with externalizing behaviors have a thinner cortex in these areas than other kids. So there is something going on in that developing brain. But we know that the brain is plastic. That is the great news and can be changed and modified throughout life. But it gets harder the older we get. And you can see the brain's ability to change in response to experiences and the amount of effort such change requires. It is easier when they're under the age of 10. And Alice Baccaro and others have done that research to show that in fact, it is easier and much more productive. So implications to society are enormous. We hear all kinds of things like from David Farrington's research about early onset tends to predict long careers. Most research on delinquency focuses on the teenage years when it's in full flow. Most intervention resources are targeted on these years, but we really need to focus on that middle years. And uh, Richard Tremblay and colleagues found really that these kids about that represent about 10% are more likely to have problems later, like difficulty at school and substance use and all the things we've already talked about. And so we also found with Dr. Depang Yang and Margaret and myself found a strong linkage between bullying behavior during childhood and subsequent criminal offense after the age of 12. And that was just using one item. If a parent on the child behavior checklist gave a two, so you rate your child zero, one or two, not evident, someone evident, very evident. If they gave their child a two on that item, cruelty, meanness, and bullying to others, they had a two time greater probability um, of having a criminal conviction by their 18th birthday. Okay, um, so the risk of having one or more subsequent criminal convictions up to the child's 18th birthday for those engaged in bullying behavior was nearly twice as high than for those who did not engage in such behavior. And then that was even controlled for age, gender, and other risk factors. And here you can see this is what you see by age 18, children who did not versus children who did. So prognosis without treatment is poor. It's just poor. And so the solution is we need to think about what works for these kids. And we need to think about that is what is going to take one of the biggest bites out of mental health and crime. So we need to think about where our efforts should be directed to, which is prevention, 
of persistent disruptive behavior, prevention of child delinquency, and the prevention of serious violent uh, juvenile offending, particularly among high-risk children. And the key is earlier the better. Evidence-based early intervention. You're going to hear me say sometimes things three times. I learned very early on. That's what we need to do to kind of get that in our brain and make it stick. It's like role playing. Okay. Um, so what works? Clinical risk management. So a lot of the things I hope that you're doing um, are involved with evidence-based practices like cognitive behavior programs are shown to be highly effective in reducing uh, recidivism. So improving social skills, problem solving ability, cognitive restructuring, which is big, which Don Meikenbaum does uh, so brilliantly and they helped us learn and role playing. And I'll share how role playing and cognitive restructuring and problem solving is one of the best predictors of uh, great outcomes uh, when you do these, work, these, these things. Programs with better implementation quality and fidelity, along with high risk offender populations, were associated with greater effect size, which is the magnitude of change in these kids. Programs incorporating anger control and interpersonal problem solving components can enhance effectiveness. We also know that effectiveness is more likely when certain factors are present, like careful assessment, use of risk and protective frameworks, which I'm going to share, a cognitive skills element, a coordinated multimodal design. These kids are complex. You just can't think you're going to give them one thing and it might be enough. Program integrity. Make sure if you're implementing these programs, you're doing it with high fidelity and integrity and long-term engagement. We also know that successful outcomes are strongly influenced by skilled, effective workers who care who care, who are warm, who are optimistic, enthusiastic, creative, and imaginative, and use their personal influence through the quality of interaction directly with young people. Relationships, relationships, relationships. When I used to do groups with kids, I used to be louder than the kids, okay? So those are things I really, really um, want you to think about. High quality supervision enhances and strengthens services. Supervision is critical. And one of our colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Karen Sewell, and her work she really found is that you need to take time and it really requires organizational support. We also know that most effective treatment for externalizing or kids such as disruptive behaviors is a combination of child-focused CBT and parent management training. And Dr. Mom, Mike and Baum, who further enhanced CBT by introducing a therapeutic technique called cognitive behavior modification. I held that book up earlier, this one here, which focuses on identifying dysfunctional self-talk, hard thoughts, thinking errors, um, in order to change unwanted behaviors. And then other interventions used like psychoeducation and behavioral therapy and family therapy and interpersonal training and school-based interventions and social skills training. We need these all. Every single piece makes a puzzle piece. And the earlier disruptive children receive intervention, the better are their long-term outcomes. And what works is we need to focus on thoughts and feelings and actions. And I'm going to show that with you, the SNAP program soon, that the goal of CBT is the focus on development of skills to deal with disruptive desires, like perspective taking and goal setting and anger management and emotional awareness and social problem solving. And that we have to identify problems, how different behaviors may lead to different outcomes. It's like that development of pathway that Rolf and Magda were working on. And I know that Buddy's working on and, and Rolf, uh, sorry, and David a lot is really looking at how that leads to different outcomes and evaluate possible consequences of these actions and role plays. If you're working with kids, CBT models, you have to be able to do role plays and role plays are critical. It's one of the, I think the things that we found in one of our research pieces that were the significant pieces. It was the role plays, the watching of the videos of their role plays, the storytelling to consolidate skills and learn. You're building different neural pathways in the brain. You're pruning what's not working and you're giving kids the opportunity to practice, practice, practice. Because I think that is what is so critical. Um, and then the parenting piece. 
We can't forget about our caregivers and our parents. Improving parenting caregiver skills reduces externalizing behaviors and improves parental mental health. I'm the first person to say, you know, like when you have children, you are not given a manual like you buy a computer and here is what you've got to do. It's what you know. And um, so you have to think about mastering um, your skills, group-based, individual-based, rely modeling and role-playing just like we did with the kids and parent-child interactions, um, learning skills such as limit setting, encouraging, family cohesive building, and increasing attention for appropriate behavior. You know, think about ourselves. We're so overwhelmed, overworked, tired. We're stuck in our homes. And how often is it that we pull on the positive behavior versus the negative behavior? Right, just think about that, right, for a second. And we also want improvement in children's mediated by parenting style. We need to think about how can we work with our children and parents together. And as you do this, I want you to think about technology, whether we like it or not. Here we are on Zoom doing this webinar instead of in person, which I would love to have been in person with all of you. We have to rely on technology. Kids use technology these days. We have to think about how much they're in front of screens. Unfortunately, that's the method today, but we have to think about technology. We have to think about youth engagement. We have to evaluate innovative or promising practices. We have to make sure programs, I said this earlier, are culturally safe, relevant, and responsive. We need to adopt a strengths-based approach, and we need to assess your practices for potential harm, and we need to share, 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 just like we are doing um, this morning. So the story. So what happened, I'm gonna to start to build the story to get into the framework now. So what ended up happening was um, in 1984, Canada raised the age of criminal responsibility from seven to 12. And that left a huge gap in services. There were no specific services designed for children under 12 in conflict with the law. And that's when our federal government said to the provinces and territories, you come up with programs. And so our work started at the Child Development Institute, formerly Earl's Court. We worked closely because it was these kids were coming to the attention at that time to the police. And so we had to work closely with the police to say, we want to work with you. We want to partner with you so that we can ensure that any child that comes to your attention under the age of 12 can be diverted to community-based services. And so we tried to build this bridge with the SNAP program. And that's what we have been doing for the last 35 years. Today, our partners are incredibly extensive, community-based organizations, children's mental health centers, schools, um, uh, recreation, um, child welfare, policing, uh, fire service, you name it, are all part of our network. And so I'm gonna start to build this. I've talked lots for the last little while. I hope you guys are okay. Please take a stretch break if you need it um, because this is like a high dive fast uh, uh, sharing here. So we've talked about why these kids, who are these kids? What might be going on with these kids that can cause this disruptive behavior? And so the first thing, and I'm working backwards, you're going to see the whole model. I'll, I'll pull it up in a second, but you'll see the dates on the bottom. But let's just go this way for now. You have kids with disruptive behavior problems. The one thing you need is timely access to services. How do you work together with your community if you can to have a one-stop number to be able to get these kids to the door? The next piece is, and I'm going to build this out in a second more, once they come to your door, do you use good standardized measures? And in the end, do they inform a really good risk need assessment? And we talk about, um, this was Dr. Chris Webster really started this with us, was an early approach, which is structured professional judgment on how you identify risks um, in order to go do good clinical risk management. And then once you get them to the door, once you have a way to assess them, do you have, actually have gender specific evidence-based intervention to meet the needs of these kids? And I'm gonna share how this evolved as well. So let me just, you could see the dates on these. We started with SNAP back in 1985. Around the same time, we realized we needed a good way to assess them for level of risk and need. So we started embarking on developing these EARLs 
it was first it was the Earl 20B for boys, then it was the Earl 21G for girls, and then now it's the Earl. We've combined them, and I'll share that a little bit for rationale again. And then do you have a way to assess them? So you can see these kind of happened around the same time. So when you're thinking about community, I want you to think about these as I start to tell the story a little bit more. So the first part, so the community referral protocol, we, as I said, we work closely. This was uh, police constable Jennifer Cadell was one of the first people we were working very closely with in order to get this police protocol going. We did a large scale study. This is Dr. Chris Kogel. We did a large scale study that he led um, that looked at um, policing understanding across the country when it comes to under children under 12. And Nicholas Slater was one of the um, first um, individuals on my team who started to um, work that, that intake line and help us figure things out from the protocol perspective. So what we found out was we partnered with the police, as I indicated, because they were, back in 1999, they were the primary source where these kids were coming to their attention if they were the under 12s. We were figuring out how can we divert this. And so in conjunction with 15 other community stakeholders, you can see many different stakeholders like recreation, children's mental health centers, education, fire service, health, education, et cetera, to create a way to start filling this gap in the system. Because we knew that kids were falling through the cracks. And it was this article that really kind of nailed it for me. This was an article, and it's a terrible article. You can see the wording. This is young boy handcuffed. And in that article, basically, they were saying, we're just going to wait till this kid turns child. We're going to charge him. You can't do that. You can't do that. We need to catch these kids to buffer their risks. And so the protocol was established that if a child has police contact or today, doesn't have to have police contact, are at risk and, and, and people are concerned about them, they can contact the central intake line, which was housed at the, at the Child Development uh, Institute, our agency, and a caregiver or parent would be called within 24 to 48 hours. And what they would get at that point is a face-to-face -face interview and assessment within five business days with an understanding that they'd be able to access treatment within a month to three months at the most. Isn't this wonderful if this is the reality? This was the reality on many different occasions. But to maintain this, you need a champion. You need people who are going to manage the central intake line. You need services that are going to be able to respond within 24 to 48 hours or five business days and be able to have these kids access programming within one to three months. The way the program was established was you have a child, they have a precipitating factor that caused them to be referred to the program. You don't have them waiting. It's unethical, it's unprofessional, but this is the reality of our world right now. A lot of kids are waiting. So this is the example of the protocol uh, flyer that was circulated. Um, it, it, there's so many variations. This is one that staff in many ways didn't like because we don't want to call our kids criminals, but these are an example. There was a one-stop number. And overall, when we did an evaluation of the protocol, there was a qualitative evaluation done. You can see that 98% of these community partners felt that this was really good for the community, okay? That the protocol was valuable and timely. 100% indicated the protocol was needed. 100% indicated that police and children's mental health were major stakeholders at that time. And the repeated theme was prevention and easy access. So keeping in mind, again, if you have a community, do you have a way to get these kids to the door in a timely manner with an understanding you're going to do good early intervention, you're gonna do good assessment, and you're gonna get the kids the right services they need. The next piece was the EARLs. So you get them to the door and we have documents I'd be happy to share. They're on our website as well on the protocol. The next piece is the, um, um, the EARLs. What we found with the EARLs, and I'm gonna go a bit faster because I'm looking at the time here. Um, so 
I very was very fortunate to work with Dr. Christopher Webster, and he is the person in regards to structured professional judgment and has been involved in all kinds of um, risk assessment um, tools, etc. And so when Chris came on board, um, he really kind of inspired us. I was when he, he watched us do a case conference uh, for our program and I had a list of risk factors. And what I was doing when in the case conference, I was I was listening to the clinician present the case and the parent and the caregiver talked and whoever was important um, in that child's life was able to be there as well. Um, I was I was filling out this form and, and he said to me, what do you have what are you doing? I said, I'm actually check marking any kind of risk factors I thought were critical. And I would put a dot on the top of the page, whether it would be green, yellow, or red. And red was, yikes, so there's a caution sign. Red was, I'm really concerned. I'm really concerned. But I had no way of organizing or structuring this. It was just based on what I saw. And he loved this, uh, loved this diagram that he um, shared with us at a Kids Not Con Summit we hosted back in 2012. And he says, you know, the risk assessment bridge, you know, you kind of go along this bridge and there's this fog and you don't know what is on the other side. And I love this drawing because it signifies so many things that we need to think about. It's that word I talked about being vulnerable and have that courage to say, no, I need to motor on. So the, we barked on developing these early risk assessment tools. Um, initially. So the EARL is a risk need assessment guide for future offending and antisocial behavior in children under the age of 12. The key aspect is clinical risk management based on need. So I want to make sure it's just not that we're assessing them for risk and doing nothing about it. That's not what these tools are for. These tools are to assess or these guides are to assess in order to do good clinical risk management based on the need. It was developed at Child Development Institute. The first version came out in 1998. It was the boys version. These were what I was doing for my thesis, my master's thesis and my PhD dissertation focused on the EARLs. We came out with revised versions of the boys in 2001, version two and version one for the girls. And currently we are in the middle of developing a third version, um, which is uh, just simply called EARL and it's a uh, of version three, which actually I'm going to go into, we actually combine the two. It was a really difficult decision, but based on the research, based on the information, we felt that it was really critical to take certain things into consideration, especially around gender, gender neutrality and other things. So we had to really be careful with that, as well as culture. So gender and culture are absolutely evident in these tools and um, they're also on the rate and we're gonna be resubmitting for that. So people using them, and this is Dr. Pia Annabring and her colleagues when they did research on it, said, you know what? These are really interesting decision enhancing tools to help us uh, help uh, provide clinicians with a thorough assessment procedure, a guide to gear the treatment interventions, and a barometer to evaluate whether a child was still considered high risk at post intervention. And you can see that just some of the things that over the years that we garnished from the EARLs, you can see that. You know, when it comes to risk for boys, it was quite evident that it was like from low to high, it was kind of like evenly stepped. Okay, but when it came to the girls, they sem seemed to be, I called them sleepers. They were low, 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 and then they were high, right? So that change went like this, not like an even stepwise for boys. So there are differences in boys and girls. And what Chris did, here's another one of his drawings, is, you know, he really nailed this when he said, something happens. We need a good mechanism to formulate um, a good plan so that we can ensure that these kids get off that trajectory. Okay, so think about Thomas the Train when you think about these roles, because this is kind of what uh, the thinking is around that. Currently, it's used in about 15 different countries. We've trained thousands of people. Uh, it's translated into six languages, Swedish, Finnish, Dutch, French, Japanese, and Norwegian. Um, and we'll hopefully, you know, building that research as we move into the next uh, version three. So really the, the tool looks at child factors, it looks at family factors, and the new tool looks at barriers to treatment. 
there are three specific areas of barrier treatment, child barriers, family barriers, and community barriers. And so when we were revising the tools, just to show you how a scientist practitioner framework looks like and works, you know, we started to brainstorm with trainers and consultants. We did a lot of clinical focus groups with our clinicians and others. We did an extensive lit review. We had a panel of risk assessment experts. And the focus was really around gender consideration. Should we keep the tools separate, cultural considerations? How can we become more culturally safe and relevant? And updating individual items, should we exclude them, add them, or update them? And as we start to progress, with the panel of cultural experts and user feedback, what we did was we embarked on cultural experts, one from the States and one from um, Australia, I, I believe. And to find an expert on culture and risk assessment, it's like a needle in a haystack, but we were able to find these two wonderful um, um, consultants who helped us with this. And then we got user feedback and then we started piloting it. And now um, the validity and reliability testing is done and we're just writing that up. So really the main consideration was these community barriers to treatment was a new item, absolutely in the new version. And this was first introduced to us by one of our New Zealand colleagues, um, Alison Sutherland, who really found a gap in services with the Maori population in her community and said, we needed a third item called um, community responsibility because we just had child and family. And so when the family is unable to get supports and resources from their community, including the school, and or there is a strong indication that the boys community holds a prejudi prejudicial attitude towards the boys culture, ethnicity, socioeconomic or other status, this is this is concerning, which we started this from the land acknowledgement. I asked you to really think about what are things we need to think about. So this is the coding sheet. This is part of the coding book. This is one item I'm just going to walk you through to show you what it looks like. The, the risk assessment tool, the URL. We set the con. So this is presence of stressors. This is item F4. It means it's a family item, presence of stressors. So it sets the context of the item. It identifies clear markers, what one needs to think about. We also think about these boxes, which highlight culture and ethnic and gender consideration here. And then we also have this clear coding section, which we really worked hard to make sure it was clear and concise. Um, and then there's also a section on notes, which provides the limits of the item and uh, defines items that may interact or may slightly overlap with others. So that's an example of this. And what we're doing now also, because that's the risk side, we've partnered with colleagues um, in the Netherlands. Um, and we are now developing a child version of the SAPROF. And this is the structured assessment of protective factors for violence. You need to do risk, but then we need to also look at not forgetting about the protective factors. So this is coming um, and I'll let the Melissa Institute know when that's available as well. So here you can see in a nutshell, this has been the 35 year of building this model. And like I said, these, this is not static. It's incredibly dynamic. There are documents and research reports and ongoing discussions of every single piece. We just met yesterday um, with our community team that we're developing in Toronto, um, which is um, under the Enhanced Youth Action Plan in Ontario. There was for the middle year strategy, there was also a black youth action plan. And so three organizations that serve predominantly the black community in Toronto also received funding to deliver SNAP. And so the five organizations, which are comprised of um, Delta, CAFCAN and Tropicana, but also the Child Development Institute's East and West sites, we're now looking at the protocol and, um, and that is the work that we're doing right now is how do we work together to ensure no child in the city of Toronto should fall through the cracks? And how do we ensure the services are culturally responsive, safe and relevant? So with the story going on and the gap, which I shared with you, what we have found is that we really have tried to build this bridge and build this bridge through SNAP. So I'm going to spend the last piece of this presentation, which is about, um, let's say about 10, 15 minutes on really focusing or 20 minutes focusing on, on, on what we know about certain pieces of it. So we know that the lack of self-control is a critical factor because this is the last piece here. So I'm gonna go back here, sorry, is looking at 
You've got a way to get the kids to the door. You have a good way to assess them. Now, do you have gender specific evidence based interventions? And so by filling in this gap, we really focused on developing this program called SNAP. And it was based on the scientific literature. We didn't do this out of the site. It was based on the scientific literature. It was also best built on best practices of what our clinicians and others were also informing us on. And one of the key things that really built on SNAP model, which is interesting because it's so coming up today, but from the very beginning, SNAP, Stop Now and Plan, was developed on the issue of emotion regulation and self-control. And you can see from this research that it says low self-control predicts problems. Lack of social emotional regulation is associated with aggression and stuff like that. And early self-regulation has a strong association with school readiness. OK, and that we know that self-control, Alex Pacero and colleagues have said this, that self-control programs are effective interventions for reducing delinquency, that latency age middle years, number seven years of warning, plus the plus the brain development piece, especially before the age 10, tend to be great candidates for learning self-control. And as self-control increases at a faster pace, delinquency decreases also at a faster pace. So that is a critical element. And this is a letter by David Meffey um, years ago. Um, this young man ended up hanging himself in a juvenile justice system. And before he was trying to get out and he wrote a letter to his mom and he identified eight things he needed to do. I need to get home. I need to respect the family. I need no swearing, keep my room, no alcohol, drugs, no stealing, ask him, no yelling. But look at number eight. I need to learn to think before I act, okay? So again, it's critical that our kids learn good strategies. When we think about this, again, um, already had um, pulled this together for us because, you know, it's not, this is just a figure. It's for illustration purposes only. So keep that in mind. When we think about that big umbrella about self-regulation, we got to think about co-regulation. We got to think about emotion regulation and there's self-control, which is impulse control. And then there's the behavioral plus the emotional thing. So we have to remember there's a lot of moving parts here and people call these things so many different things. But what we know is Individuals with low self-control, we need to focus on them and we need to improve that so we can increase the activity in self-control networks of the brain. And studies like the one we did with Dr. Alex Pacero shows that in just a short time period of three months, you can see an, an effect size, great effect size coming out of this where pre-post and then uh, an ability to maintain that self-control. So here is SNAP. And I'm going to introduce you to them um, as we go through this. Um, so SNAP, as I said, was established in 1985. It is an evidence-based trauma-informed gender-specific model that teaches elementary school-age children with disruptive behavior problems and, um, and their parents and their caregivers how to really stop and think before they act and make better choices in the moment. I'll talk about the proven impact as we go along, but it's really built within a scientist practitioner model where you have research throughout this thing. We have a strategy, which is the technique. I'm going to share that. You have your programs that we built along it, our principles, our theoretical underpinnings and our research. And really it's that balance between good clinical practice and research and implementation and fidelity um, that's critical here. So the key nugget of the strategy is how do you link your thoughts, feelings, and actions? It's a common CBT piece, thoughts, feelings, and actions. So here are our core nine principles that formulate SNAP and here are the five core uh, theories within a developmental framework, which is cognitive behavioral, attachment-based, social interaction learning. We have a feminist lens as well as systems. And the one thing that we have been really working on in the last decade, 10 years, is ensuring that the program is culturally relevant and safe and responsive. And we started this interesting journey because we were being invited in to communities which were Indigenous or Aboriginal communities and being invited in. And we had to figure out um, was SNAP safe for this community? Even though we were being invited in, we needed to make sure, was this the right fit for the community and did it work? And how do we ensure that it becomes more what the community needs? As a result of that work, um, we were asked um, by the Ontario government to, um, under the Black Youth Action Plan, to see if we can do something similar 
with the Black and Afro uh, African Canadian community, and we did. And so we were we did this. Uh, both of these uh, works were done as co-development, co-creation with um, our leading consultants and experts in this area of study. So this is just some visuals from uh, sites that in the Indigenous community where they've looked at, you can see the adaptation of the logo where it's in a medicine wheel. You can see the name of the program that stands for SNAP in the Cree. Um, this is an example of how they turned the learning log, uh, wheel of self-control and wheel of plans into um, a way that made sense for them in their community. And if done right, you can see the uptake. You can see, you know, 2,000, over 2,400 children across 153 classrooms. Um, that, was their, that was the SNAP for Schools model were actually benefiting from the program. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. Lights, camera, action, quiet on the set. Please so this you. is SNAP and we had to think about, remember I talked about technology, we had to think but creatively how to improve delivering SNAP in our schools and this, these animations are from our SNAP for schools model. The SNAP uh, under 12, uh, sorry, the SNAP under 12 program for boys and girls are clinical programs that are typically delivered in person and I'll share what's going on as a result of the pandemic, how we had to really pivot fast to help our sites. So these are the SNAP boys and girls programs that are evidence-based. Uh, we work closely with the schools. Now we have a SNAP for schools program and I saw some staff, I think it was Jimmy Madero, so I think he's on here, um, who's now working in this program and delivering it for years. And then we have our SNAP youth leadership and this is really was developed out of our camp initially, um, where we took eight uh, children, five boys and three girls, and we realized um, that these kids had incredible leadership opportunities. And what I'm so proud of is that out of this program, uh, we have staff that work for us today, as well as um, ongoing peace. So it's so critical. And Abdi Muhammad um, leads the boys piece and our organization of really bringing it to a whole different level. And out of that also evolved, people kept saying, well, you know, if it's good for under 12s, could we use it for you justice kids? So we embarked on developing this. And this is uh, Mark Walsh, myself, Che Latchford and Sarah Woods, the leads on this particular model and really was looking at, could we actually do this? And it started in custody, but what we did was we bridged uh, probation as well as um, uh, community, community, sorry. This is the level of the severity. So for example, you don't need kids to go into high clinical programs if they don't need it. So our universal prevention model is what we call our SNAP for Schools model, where you see those animations where teachers or educators can access uh, this once they're trained. We also have what we have a level two and a level three program, a level four, which is, you can see it's time limited where you know the mental health problems that affect functioning maybe in some areas to more more intensive services which are continued care uh, models where you give the kids what they need for as long as they need and then these kids can go into the youth leadership component once they turn 12 or we also um, access other services for them in the community and the snap for you justice is a different program this is um, aside from the under 12 piece we're actually piloting and testing which is really about does this program can this program and the the preliminary evaluation is extremely promising on this. So this are this is a program designed for kids already involved in the justice system and um, whether they're in custody, probation and community. Um, and this quote, I'm just going to really quickly, what is the highlight of this quote was this young man who had been through the program who really um, benefited from it. He says that um, he um, uh, boosted his confidence. He's upon finishing, he made big improvements. He's in the career and trade in sheet metal. He says, I'm getting a pension. I'm getting benefit, benefit, benefits. And it's also a licensed trade and the SNAP program benefited my life because I, before I was not focused and getting into trouble. I was getting, I was not focused, but I was getting in trouble with the law. And now I'm able to support my family and my loved ones financially. And he was reaching out because he was hoping that we could help his brother. It's just an example. So when we 
think about ACEs and they think about where some of these gaps are, where we really think SNAP really is effective is within a social, emotional, and cognitive impairment before they start to adopt these um, health risk behaviors. And as we saw this, it's really this part that makes a difference. So now I'm going to walk you through, so how does this all work? So let's have a close look at what might be happening in the brain. Okay, so something happens that triggers you and the amygdala, the amygdala, the amygdala and we have an emotional reaction. This can really be felt in the whole body. The limbic system sends signal to the rest of the brain to act on these emotions. You can see this is what's going on here. Okay, it's time. That's when we say it's time to use your snap. Snapping your fingers can help you to cue in to use your snap. This helps you to stop now and take a deep breath count to 10, take a step back possibly to help calm your body cues. And body cues are things like you're feeling tense, you're shallow breathing, maybe you put your hands into fists, you're feeling hot. This will stop the amygdala hijacking the rest of the brain. And I'll show you how it works in the role play in a second. So the next piece is the, the and. So stop now and, and this is where we say we have to identify our hard thoughts. These are typically not helpful or realistic, unrealistic, and that may make you feel anxious, angry, and frustrated. Things like, he's doing that to make me mad, and replace them with a cool thought that's more helpful, more realistic. Because if you keep saying he's doing that to make me mad, even though you calm your body cues, what's going to happen? You're going to continue to get aroused. So you need to say things like, okay, this is hard, but I can handle this. I'm not going to let him bug me or get to me. This gives the prefrontal cortex time to calm down and control the amygdala and the limbic system further. Okay, and the last piece of stop now and plan is the plan. These steps will allow the higher cognitive functions of the prefrontal cortex to plan the next move in a rational way rather than an emotional or impulsive decision made by the limbic system. And effective plans make your problem smaller instead of bigger. Okay, and not hurt anyone or anything or yourself, and you feel okay about it. And that's how it works. The stop, which is get control of your body and is starting to challenge those hard thoughts and replacing them with cool thoughts. And then your plan is come up with a good plan. And remember, it's sequential, but it's not sequential all the time. The thought comes in, something happens with that trigger and something happens. The moment is your thought goes, I don't believe he did that, right? And then you start to feel things in your body. And that's when you need to start to think about how can I calm myself down? How can I calm my brain down? And how can I get to a good plan? So when we practice self-regulation and self-control, the prefrontal cortex gets better and faster at controlling the limbic system, just like I presented all those stats earlier or, or those facts. In turn, we get better at self-regulation, emotion regulation and self-control. So it's about practice, practice, practice. How many times have we heard that? The more we practice, the better we get. And the SNAP strategy helps you deal with difficult situations and problems in our lives. So remember to use your SNAP. I can't tell you how many times <laughs> in my own home, my husband or my children will say, mom, I think you need to read some of those books you're writing or mom, I think you need to use snap because emotions and feelings are natural. They're okay. It's how we handle them that makes the difference. So I'm going to share this with you. And this is Johnny and watch him use snap. This, this is the strategy and watch if you can see the red light, yellow light and green light. May I please have my ball back? No. It's not yours, it's mine. I know. Every day, children are faced with making difficult choices in the moment. At this moment, Johnny is starting to get angry. I want my ball back. He took my ball. I want to hit him. I want to hit him. Johnny is using an emotion regulation cognitive behavioral technique called SNAP. SNAP has taught Johnny how to calm his body and emotions and replace his hard thought, I want to hit him, 
with a cool thought. If I hit him, he won't be my friend, and I'll get in trouble. Maybe I can get my ball back if I can ask him nicely. Can I please have my ball back? No. I said give me my ball. No. Before learning Snap, when Johnny felt angry, he would lose self-control. Using Snap helps Johnny control his body by using calming strategies, challenge his hard thoughts, and make a plan to keep his problems small. I'm gonna hit him. Gonna hit him. Asking nicely didn't work, but I have to stay calm. Maybe I can ask him to give me my ball back again. Asking and saying please didn't work. What's worked before? I wanna hit him. I'm just gonna hit him. I have to slow my breathing down. I can handle this. I need to pick a plan that's gonna work for me. I'm gonna tell him the ball is special. Special. May I please have my ball back? It's my favorite ball and my mom bought it for me. Okay, here you go. Oh, thanks. SNAP helps children make better choices in the moment, building healthier and stronger children, families, So and I hope you're able to see that overlay of the red light, yellow light, and green light, and how that actually strategy works. And the more you practice, the more you do it, the more the kids are able to adapt it. There's a perfect video on our website that you're able to look at on the Stop Now and Plan website. Um, if you go to the YouTube channel button, which is what happens when you come to a SNAP door, and it will share with you what happens at the intake and assessment process. We, the next step is that kids are, are assigned to specific groups based on their ages and genders. We also have a concurrent SNAP parent group. Those are the core components of the program. And then once they finish that, based on their level of risk and need, they can are offered other components, service components like individual counseling or family counseling or school support or connections to other community supports and recreation. And for girls, there's a girls growing up healthy group around relationship development, as well as youth leadership and a homework club we're calling now CISA, and also looking at arson prevention. So you can see that based on this, there's kind of a recipe based on the child's level of risk and need, they're going to get what is uh, needed based on their assessment. So the secret sauce that people keep telling us what SNAP is, is really that it's based on the level of risk and need, that the core strategy targets self-control right from the beginning. Today, we hear lots about it, but 35 years ago, that was the key aspect of what SNAP uh, was. It's multifaceted. It can work with the child, the family, the community. Um, that it's ecosystemic. We work with various systems like schools. Um, that the SNAP strategy and technique, it's an easy to use, remember acronym, stop now and plan. And it has common language, whether you are in working with a child, whether you're working with a family, whether you're working with an educator, the language is the same. And there's a lot of repetition and consistency, as you've heard in my presentation, done for a reason. It's to really start to build different pathways and neurons in our brain to think about things maybe. And then there's fun and engaging. You saw the, 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 the Snapdragon there. And there's a really good implementation and fidelity process. It's evidence-based, it's based on the scientist practitioner model, and it's really flexible and adaptable. Given COVID right now and the pandemic, we need to more so ever think how we actually are able to help our kids and families. Um, they're more irritable, um, they're isolated, they're stressed out. Um, the study found that 83% of parents whose kids were already experiencing issues, they're saying that they're getting worse. And parents whose kids were not are finding like 59% in this study, noticing drastic changes in behavior of their kids, like outbursts and irritability and personality and sleep disturbances and sadness. So we had to pivot quick. And I love this quote. Every time you think of calling a kid attention seeking, this year, now, consider changing it to connection seeking and see how your perspective changes. I love that. I think unbelievable, so true. So we had to think about how we pivoted quickly um, because we knew that um, we couldn't deliver face-to-face -face services. 
So we had to take our materials and start to adapt them uh, virtually. And we had to also rely on our wonderful clinical teams and um, at, at the Child Development Institute, as well as our affiliate sites to really work together to us to figure out how to do this virtually. And from what I hear, a lot of our sites um, and our own organization is reporting that the virtual services are going really well. Now I'm gonna put a caution here that just because virtual services are going well, which is fantastic, we need to evaluate that. But I don't think it can also replace the face-to-face. -face. Kids need that relationship building. They need that, that, that attention. So we have to think when we come out of this, what works and for whom, and how do we pivot, and how do we um, make sure that what we're doing. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to session eight. Today, we are going to talk about peer pressure and what you can do if you feel pressured to do something you don't want to do. Who can tell me Just what peer pressure Just sharing an means? example of what these animations look like, and this is from our Snap for Schools. And the role plays are actually embedded right in because role plays, I said, are critical. So watch this one. Hey, Quentin, the teacher's not looking. Let's get this chair. It's so fun. If I kick the chair, will he be my friend? Or will he not be my friend? Oh, my stomach hurts. I'm nervous. <sighs> if I kick the chair, I'll get in trouble, and I want to keep my problems small. Logan, you know what? I'm not going to kick the chair because it's rude and disrespectful and I don't want to get in trouble. Okay, so this way it helps that we also have things like mindfulness exercises as well to engage the kids. I'm going to bypass this one just for time's sake because I'm aware. So really, again, it's about building the evidence and how you as an organization look at your program planning, your process evaluation, your research and how you continue building that knowledge. And we call this our evaluation and implementation checklist uh, barometer, where we actually track and you can see the darker the barometer it gets, the better we are in specific things that we're doing. Um, and this is process evaluation activities and then research and outcome evaluation, doing everything from client satisfaction all the way up to more third party external evaluations up to benefit cost analysis and now implementation science. So here's the evidence and then I'm going to, I'm aware that I need to leave a few minutes here for some questions in time. I apologize, it's running a bit longer than I thought, is we know that we're able to actually decrease externalizing behaviors and increase um, all these issues. So aggression, role breaking, depression, anxiety, and also police contact and juvenile justice involvement. And we're able to increase self-control, emotion regulation, social skills, even caregiver relationships and parent management uh, skills training. And this was a randomized control trial done in Pittsburgh, where they randomly control, uh, randomly assigned kids to either SNAP or treatment as usual. It was no, it was not a crossover design. It was, um, it was simply a randomized control. You can see that kid, this pink line represents kids who fall above this line or at this line are doing worse than 98% of kids their age. So we're talking about the top 2%. And you can see the black line is SNAP kids. You can see a far greater uh, rate of ex uh, acceleration from pre to post in just three months months and then continue on. Treatment as usual kids also get better, but SNAP uh, statistically outperformed treatment as usual. And even between the two conditions, I think the effect size was, was around 0.3. They also looked at mechanisms of change. And you can see this is the darkest line is the SNAP program, treatment as usual, that emotion regulation increased significantly in just two, three months. That was the group component and then was maintained. Pro-social communication, same thing. Um, in regards to expectations of remorse, treatment as usual teetered off where SNAP continued up here. And expectations of punishment for antisocial behavior really increased significantly for class, uh, uh, SNAP kids where it didn't for treatment as usual. So we talked to Jeff, Dr. Jeff Burke, who led the study with Rolf as well. 
you know, so if these were the treatment outcomes, what might be going on? And that's when he, they really said they found that the mechanism was increasing emotion regulation, self-control, pro-social behaviors, positive parenting, and parental stress. And here's a study by the University of Toronto and sick kids with uh, Dr. Lewis, Granite, and Waltring and their team. Pre-SNAP, you can see there was a lot of activity in that um, uh, ventral, re the, the front part of that brain that is your fight, flight, and freeze, and not much was happening in that, um, you know, part of the brain that's controlled for executive functioning. And so you can see in just 13 weeks, you can see a decrease activity, and an, you start to see some reactivity in that control center of the brain that is responsible for being able to think stop and think before you act, which was really, really interesting. And this was also based on standardized measures. If the standardized measures showed significant changes in the children's behavior, so did this, uh, they, so did their EEG scans. So when I talked about the, the linkage between bullying behavior, the SNAP model is, was also found to be effective with both groups, kids who engaged in bullying and those who did not, um, especially from pre post treatment decreases. And this is the cost benefit. You got to think about where you're spending your money. So for convictions only, every dollar you spend, you save up to four. And for all crimes, every dollar you spend, you send on average 30 to up to 56 and you can see that it's linked to pretty moderate effect size you know you can reduce crime with even a little moderate effect size of 0.2 of 18 percent and up to 0.4 with 33 percent and wispy found an 86 percent likelihood that snap would produce benefits greater than costs so tyler when we went through the Tyler case, they also found the same thing with regards to SNAP had the highest averted costs. And as a result of these robust findings, SNAP continues to get and submit for evaluations from other sources um, to get ratings of promising model or effective. So where are we today? And I'm going to end with this because I'm aware of the time. And um, today we are um, in the middle of a large scale across Canada. We were using a venture philanthropy model. I talked about that with the book uh, about David Pico. So the, the focus of that is if you take smart money, you take industry experts and you take a proven social innovation like SNAP, you can create massive social change. But it takes government, it takes founding, it takes foundations, it takes private investors, um, and it takes um, um, business sector partners to help also make this uh, happen. And so when we did this uh, goal, we had to actually do this in order for us to hit 100 sites, that was our target, we had to raise $12 million. And the $12 million was um, to help organizations with their scale up costs, like training, consultation materials and equipment. And because of this, we have learned that it takes so much courage and so much passion. And I would show you this, but for time's sake, I'm gonna bypass it. This is what it feels like. It felt like not only for us, we had to trust the process and work with our partners that we can do this. Imagine from an implementation science perspective that you're gonna scale up to hundred organizations in five years. And so we were had all the equipment, we had the supports, we were harnessed, but then we also have to feel that on the flip side, this is what an affiliate site might feel like when they're joining us, that they have to trust us that we are going to support them and we're gonna be there for them. And actually, <laughs> this picture is, is actually my daughter, Jessie, um, where she's uh, she did go bungee jumping and this is, I can't even imagine what that might feel like. So having said that, where we are today, I am absolutely honored and delighted to say as we enter our fifth year, that will end in December of this year. We are having a footprint right across the country um, in regards to SNAP, and you can see that's what's happening. And, the, and when you have to do this work, you think this is your plan, but the reality is this is what might happen. So you have to think about that. I'd be remiss because we're in Florida that I wouldn't share this wonderful um, one example of a mobilization group um, that is led by the Florida Network. It started with uh, the Jack, the Juvenile Assessment Center back in 2001, 2002, where we did a study group, which was the Young Offender Process with Wansley Walters and Kathy Burgos and Richard Dembo and Jeannie from the Department of Juvenile Justice 
Alexis and Christy and all of them. And then today, I'm delighted to say that the Florida Network, um, along with um, Stacy Gromovich and uh, Megan Picken and Brandy and Laura and Melba, are all working together with these organizations and our team leads to be able to scale their SNAP program across the state of Florida, and they're doing a wonderful job with that. So I'm going to bypass this, how we keep it together. We developed a system, and our secret sauce is really our teams. Our teams are what keep us going. You need to dream big, you need to get stuff done, and you need to have fun doing it. And the last piece is we don't want to raise children who have to recover from their childhood. And that's a Pam Leo saying, which I love. I'd love to share one little video clip if you, whoever wants to stay on. It's one of our graduates, Bobby, who's given me permission to share this with you. I think he'd really find this inspiring. I use SNAP on a daily basis. I mean, when people think, okay, we're teaching kids about SNAP and that's it. I use it every day. Two people ask me, how'd you, how, how'd you control your anger? How'd you, how'd you conquer your anger? I did it. It is still there. I get angry every day. But snap is what stopped me from reacting. Snap is what stopped me from, somebody cuts me off. So, I, I, yeah, I could hit them with my car and get out and beat the crap out of them. But now I've got a damaged car. I've also got charges on me with assault and, and dealing with the police now. So it's in my daily life. I stop. I think about the consequences of going, you know what? My day's better. I didn't make somebody's day worse because I was feeling bad. And that's what snap does for me today. What are you most proud of and why? <laughs> My family. I am. Um, I wouldn't have had it without SNAP. I, I could not, you know, I never thought I'd ever have a family. I never thought because I didn't care about anybody else. But now, because of SNAP, I have a family. I, I, I think, great, you know, I think of every day as a positive day. Because if I didn't meet you and I didn't have the SNAP program, I would not be sitting here. I would not be here today. I would be in a prison or dead. And that's, 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 I mean, people say, well, are you sure? Is it that strong? And it's like, yes, mm -hmm. I would have been dead. Okay. So I'm going to just end there. Um, I think that tells it all um, sure. there, what we need to do to invest in our young people. And really, if we could take the last minute or two, just to, to, if there's any, any thoughts, any questions, I'd be happy to stay on if need be. Lena, there was one thing that was mentioned in the chat. Yeah. Um, it, it actually went for everybody, but it says, what's the difference between assessing children and assessing and as asset mapping them? And how often do we assess a child's potential to address their problem? Great that's question. By Galaxy J. Okay. Stone. It's a great question. So you, when you do your intake, you have to do a thorough echo systemic assessment. You have to use multi -source, multiple sources of information, multiple agents, you need to be able like sources of information. And we developed the EARLs to help us then pull that all together to uh, formulate a risk assessment that we can then formulate a really good clinical risk management plan on. So that is done. We do that pre-intervention. We do that at post um, like intervention, and, and if not six months, at least at six months um, during a case planning. And then we do it every six months thereafter until uh, termination or discharge. So it is, it is, it's, it's onerous, but it's important to make sure that as the children's needs change or shift in the families that we're able to meet their needs uh, on a consistent basis. And we are delighted to have heard from you, learn from you. This is an extraordinary effort. 35 years in the making. We're really, really late to the show and happy to be part of your life right now. And thank you. very, very uh, honored to have had you with us. Um, and uh, thank you again for dedicating your life to this and for You're... allowing us to learn from you. Uh, and your colleagues on this. Uh, yeah, and, and you are very welcome, Tony. For me, it's about the village and those that we're able to surround ourselves with. And I've been very honored and privileged to have had many people um, support me, support our work, um, and very, very honored for that. 
Uh, Dr. Aguimeri, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation and for uh, staying to answer some questions that the participants pose to us throughout. So uh, you've got, um, I am Amanda Burns and we have Melissa Sedote from the Melissa Institute. We're just gonna ask you some of the questions that the participants uh, sent to us throughout the presentation. Perfect, and it was an honor being part of this. All right, so the first question that I have is, why not focus on the early years if it is a greater return on investment, meaning prenatal to fifth grade years? That is an excellent question, Melissa. My question is, why aren't we? <laughs> why aren't we? Like we research shows the um, I, it's the home nurse practitioner program, for example, extremely effective. Um, we should be investing in uh, pre-birth, right? Uh, you know, healthy development of a child prior to and then pregnancy um, and then birth. Um, and then from birth to six, age six is giving them that head start and there's that healthy head start um, we should be absolutely doing that and then we need to be thinking as these kids progress into elementary school and up to the age of 12 before middle school goes on and on that we need to be giving these kids the right treatment services if needed based on their level of risk and need okay and then we need to think about universal prevention Universal prevention has a huge return on investment if it's the right universal prevention programs that we need to be putting in place. Of course. Yeah. Great question. And I think going off of your answer to that is SNAP is individually based. Are there any emphasis placed on environmental strategies to improve the social context in which the youth live? Oh, I wish we could, you know, it's one of those ones you write a flag. Um, you, we absolutely have to take into account the neighborhood and community. And, you know, I think, is it Lee Robbins did a study years and years and years ago, I think the seventies, and she, uh, said that kids who come from very high risk neighborhoods have a very high risk of flipping into the juvenile justice system. You know, there was that movie, Keanu Reeves, am I saying his name right? Keanu Reeves did hardball and I wish I would get a clip of it. And it shows, you know, he was working in a high risk neighborhood or community because he had to do community service. And um, there's a clip of showing the kids having to go from home to school and if they didn't get through the door at a certain time, they might get um, drawn into the gang life, right? And I think we live in a community and societies and not all of them are safe for our kids. And I think we need to invest in safer communities. So I think it is David Hawkins has done a lot of work on communities of care. And we have to think about what it is that we can invest in. How do we ensure you can live in a beautiful, um, rich, neighborhood, I, you know, where homes, wealthy homes, and there's no, nothing really for the kids there either, right, except nice homes. So we need to think about where are the parks, where are the playgrounds, where are the recreation centers, and are the recreation people trained, and are they paid, and child and youth workers, I can go on and on. My daughter is a child and youth worker in a day treatment classroom. You know, um, they work so hard. How do we, how do we ensure that they're being compensated? It's like, like individuals in long-term care facilities, we're hearing that all over the place. So I can go on and rant a little bit. So that's a great question. <laughs> Thank you. That was a great answer. Um, and the next one is, if a child already has a high ACE score and has experienced significant trauma by the age of five or six, is SNAP a good program for this child since SNAP is a prevention program? Well, SNAP is a prevention and intervention program, right? The SNAP for schools is a universal prevention. It depends on how you look at it. Is it you're preventing them? Is it prevention program because you're preventing them from flipping into the juvenile system? Uh, a system or is it an intervention program? Because they're already engaging in activities. If they were 12, they could be charged in Canada, for example. So that's how it depends depends on the semantics of how you do that. But having, let me address that question though, about trauma and early. So the, the, whoever asked that question, that's an excellent question. We need to be thinking about trauma and we need to be thinking about how we do this. We actually wrote, um, I have it here. It's a great book, uh, just got published. It is Working with Trauma Exposed Children and Adolescents by Joanna Pizzullo and Greg Bennell. And we actually wrote a chapter 
in the book about using a trauma-informed lens to understand and implement evidence-based practices with children with disruptive behavior um, in school and beyond. So these are a little bit older because they're six and up. So when kids are, are, have experienced such severe trauma, you need to deal with the trauma. You absolutely need to deal with the trauma and you need to deal with um, good um, therapeutic approaches that work for that specific issue, whether it's sexual abuse or what the uh, death of a family member, whatever the modality is. But at the same time, you need to then think about once you're dealing with that, what other things are going to impede on that child? What other things could that child use? What supports do they need, right? Are they experiencing emotional, you know, outbursts? Do they lack self-control, right? So that's where SNAP can be effective. But what we found, we did another study that looked at anxiety and conduct problems. And we're going to publish this study was if the child was high in anxiety and high on conduct. So let me start. If the child was high on conduct and lower anxiety, they enter SNAP. If they were equally high in anxiety and um issues with self-control and emotional regulation, then SNAP would work. If they were higher on anxiety and a little bit lower on conduct, let's deal with the anxiety more and then deal with the, the, the conduct piece. So that's where research, that scientist practitioner model really helps to reinforce that is, those issues and what the kids need and, and based on their level of risk and need. Perfect. And the I think the last question that I have here is when we frame a comprehensive community approach, strategically, have you witnessed a project that is framed around what research says children need to be given the best possibility to transition successfully from childhood to adulthood? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I can see I sigh because that's a, that's a big question. Um, so I do, I'm not 100% sure I've got it right. So my understanding is that we need to actually, so in SNAP, for example, we're actually um, still working with kids after they turn 12. So they come into the program, Bobby, which I showed at the very end for those who stayed on, who graciously let me, he actually just texted me, who graciously let me use his, his story, um, was six when he came into service. And once he turned 12, um, I remember, you know, he came into the SNAP program, so he was finished the SNAP program, but he, he was coming to our SNAP camp every summer, and you had to be under the age of 12, and he was turning 12, and he said to me, you can abandon me like everybody else in my life right now, because he was turning in, so we knight those seamless systems, the services, right, those that deal with the zero to six, then the six to 12, and then the 12 and up, we need to build seam, um, seamless systems, so kids don't have to keep and families have to keep falling through the cracks and waiting and waiting and waiting so I think we have a lot of work to do and we need to do better yeah Dr. Augie Mary thank you so much for for joining us this was a wonderful presentation and we just appreciate your time you're very welcome it was my honor thank you for having me